Welcome everybody to the third session of today's uh, 25th anniversary conference uh, on graduate art history for the Mid-Atlantic region. I'm Jonathan Katz, and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, our panel today. Uh, we're going to be ranging across the entirety of the 20th century today, uh, especially looking at art in Europe. And we're going to be specifically looking at the question in three very different iterations of why or how uh, art is related to governing schemas. Uh, essentially, what we're looking at here is the sort of disciplinary affect of various taxonomies of understanding how art fits into certain systems. And although they're very, very different, all three papers negotiate that problematic. So I'd like to first introduce um, our very first speaker, uh, Hannah Shaw. Uh, I'll be just mentioning the title of her of her talk, uh, Negotiating Cult uh, Cultural Landscape in Third Reich Germany on August Sanders' uh, photo book, The Eiffel. Uh, and uh, she will be introduced by her advisor, uh, Andre Zervignon. Hi, my name is Andres Mario Servegon, and I'd like to introduce Hannah Shaw, a doctoral student in the Rutgers Art History Department. Hannah is uh, very accomplished already, having published an article in Photo Researcher on the trouble with August Sanda's censorship. She has also had a, a one-year grant at the DAAD and a Getty Foundation Library grant. In addition, she's been working on the MoMA Zanda project, which has been an ongoing initiative for a number of years now. She is currently, in addition to being a PhD student in our program, a graduate curatorial assistant at the Zimmerly Art Museum, where she has curated and co-curated multiple exhibitions, including It's Just a Job, Bill Owens and Studs Terkel on Working in the in 1970s America, and Tiananmen Square, 1989, photographed by Kyung H. Hai. Please welcome Hannah Shaw. Hi. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zervagon, for that kind introduction, and Dr. Katz for moderating this panel. And lastly, to everyone at the Barnes who's made this day possible. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, let's see here. In fall 1933, a local publisher invited the German photographer August Sander to create a series of small photo books devoted to the landscape, built environment, cultural artifacts, and people of different regions in Western Germany. With its focus on the intersection between nature and human civilization, the series fell well within this uh, established category of cultural landscape. While the genre was not new, it had become ideologically charged since the Nazis seized power earlier that year. The concept of cultural landscape overlapped with many core principles of the regime, among them blood and soil and Lebensraum or living space, as well as programs aimed at strengthening the Volksgemeinschaft or people's community through tourism and access to nature. Yet it was also a genre that had intrigued Saunders since the Weimar period likely contributing to his desire to accept the offer. In a radio de lecture delivered in 1931, for example, he explained how physiognomic studies could be conducted, conducted through landscape photography. Quote, man puts his own stamp on the landscape with his works. We can see the human spirit of a particular age expressed in the landscape, and we can comprehend it with the camera. It is the same for architecture and industry and all other large and small human works. The landscape within a particular language boundary expresses the historic physiognomic image of a nation. This was analogous to the approach he pursued in his famous sociological study of Germany begun in the 1920s called People of the 20th Century. Although never finished, the project and the photo book that emerged from it, Face of Our Time, have earned Sandra a place among the fathers of modernist photography. This paper focuses on the series' first volume, Die Eiffel, about the mountainous region along Germany's western border with Belgium and Luxembourg. Die Eiffel displays a heightened resistance to the ideological aims of the regime 
as well as an engagement with the methodology that guided people of the 20th century. If resistance was Sanders' aim, however, some of his strategies backfired and ultimately reified the propagandistic utility of the volume. In formulating his approach to cultural landscape in Die Eiffel, Sander avoided contemporary discourse by deferring to the values and rhetoric of the Naturschutz or Nature, Nature Conservancy movement as it existed before 1933. Specifically, he focused on the Eiffelverein, a nature appreciation and preservation organization devoted to the region. As historian Thomas Lankin has compellingly argued, during the Weimar period, Rhineland Naturschutz organizations like the Eiffelverein tried to manage rather than deny modernization, advocating a balanced approach to issues like technological intervention and tourism. In the Third Reich, by contrast, tourism was not only fully embraced, but also treated as a means to enhance the unity and submissiveness of the German folk through programs like Strength Through Joy. After 1939, tourism became a strategy to metabolize newly colonized territories to the east. Public, work projects, public works projects like the Autobahn likewise prioritized the Nazi strategic goals over ecological concerns. Echoing the Weimar era calls for restraint, the dangers posed Echoing the Weimar era calls for restraint, the dangers posed by over-tourism appears as a leitmotif in Sandra's two-page introduction to Die Eiffel. Pointing to the recent influx of automobile traffic generated by the construction of a racetrack in the 1920s, Sandra wrote that, quote, the concern now is growing that contemporary, contemporary achievements in technology and civilization may destroy the image of the landscape whose unique beauty was only so recently recognized, end quote. What was at risk, Sander suggested, was a cultural landscape defined by a special harmony between nature and culture. To articulate this idea, Sander included a lengthy passage written by the 19th century founder of the Eiffelverein, Adolf Drunke. Describing the view from the highest mountain in the region, Drunke recounted, quote, the plateau is bejeweled with the fresh green of beech woods. Here and there lie friendly villages surrounded by countless conical mountains partially crowned with the remains of grand castles, the seats of high noble lineages. Out of the valleys flow the mist, which in the light of sunrise assumes fantastical shapes, and over everything in the north one sees the lovely shapes of the Siebengebirge and the, uh, and the rich Rhine Valley, out of which the Cologne Cathedral emerges. In this description, the built environment not only fits seamlessly into the natural one, but the two are symbolically intertwined with humble village ne villages nestled into valleys, noble castles on mountain peaks, and the Rhineland's most famous mountains, the Siebengebirge, standing in parallel with its most famous building, the Cologne Cathedral. These sentiments and those of the Weimar era preservationists who sought balance in the face of modernity's pressures are woven throughout the volume's photographs and photographic juxtapositions. The first two pages of the volume, in fact, seem to recreate Dronka's account, showing a medieval church juxtaposed with two mountain vistas, the first of which notably displays the integration of homes, fields, transportation infrastructure, and even castle ruins into the mountainous environment. Shot from a low angle, the imposing Abbey Church of Maria Loch mirrors the mountains on the opposite page, its three towers now appearing not unlike mountain peaks. During the 1920s, the Abbey monks partnered with the Eiffelverein to block a public works project that threatened the ecosystem of neighboring Lahar Lake. They succeeded, leaving the lake undisturbed, and so it appears calm and vast against a dark mountain ridge as the fourth photograph in Die Eiffel. A completed public works project, the Ofert Dam, is featured later in the volume. Its harmony with nature is illustrated within the photograph through color resonances and composition. By occupying a mere quarter of the frame, the dam appears as just one element of the natural setting rather than a force controlling it. In the full spread, the arc of the dam, turned on its side in the volume's vertical format, repeats the curve of the tree on the facing page. 
Built around the 20th century, the dam provided power and water to the Eiffel region, but also helped create an ecologically advantageous reservoir. Given this, the dam was likely seen by Weimar era preservationists as an example of responsible technological intervention into the landscape. The final page of Die Eiffel offers another comparison between a man-made structure and a natural one, in this case, the Caucasus Cave and a medieval moated castle located nearby. A coherence between the two structures is implied again through formal resonances between the photographs. You can see kind of this curving uh, S shape in both of them. In his treatment of the region's people and social environment, Sander looked not to the Eiffel Verein, but to the comparative methodology he used in people of the 20th century. In this approach, Sander focused on how his subjects were shaped by profession and social class. Indeed, the volume's portraits display a sensitivity to both social class and regional variation, suggesting in the process that there was not one essential type of Eiffel farmer. Moving from the Denborn farmer on the upper left to the Gamun farmer below, the subjects progress from the hard scrabble to the bourgeois. In a gesture typical of Saunders' photography, these class distinctions are underscored by the subject's attributes. All three men are holding a pipe, but the Denborn farmer's is wooden and presumably handmade, while the Gamun farmer's is enameled with gilding. The men's hats, or lack thereof, play a similar role, as does the presence or absence of a spouse. Near the middle of the volume, Sander presented three types of dwellings that existed in the region. Apartments tightly packed together along the banks of the Ruhr River, a traditional straw-roofed farmstead, and a more modern farmstead comprised of stately multi-story buildings. The differences, the differences in construction suggest again that class and even cultural variation existed among the region's people. On the one hand then, Die Eiffel trained the reader to see the viewer like a Weimar era preservationalist rather than the more strident Nazi ideologue who understood the German soil as a source of racial purity. The volume also fostered a view of the social character of the region as dynamic and varied rather than essentialized and earthbound. This stood in contrast to the work of photographers like Anna Lendevi Dirksen, who used their photo books to visually underscore the regime's claims about the folk's fundamental connection to their land. On the other hand, however, Sanders' deferral to the Eiffel Verein heightened the volume's utility as propaganda in other ways. By underscoring the harmonious and relatively undisturbed nature of the region, Die Eiffel participated in one of the chief propagandistic functions of the medium, as described by Rolf Saxe. In his influential 2003 book, The Education to Look Away, Saxe argue, argued that photography helped instill a sense of peace and happiness in the population that encouraged them to ignore the true horrors of the regime. As others have noted, apolitical and amusing entertainment also played a significant role in propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels' framework for controlling the population through media. An account of the origins of the uh, cultural landscape series by Sanders' son, Gunther, supports the idea that the regime could find propagandistic potential in the volumes, even if they eschewed references to party dogma. As Gunther recalled, quote, Pictures of the German countryside were in much demand from in magazines and books. A well-known Rhineland, Rhineland publishing firm suggested that Saunders should provide the illustrations for a series of small booklets on the German countryside. The German or Reich um, Chamber of Literature was in agreement and suggested the continuation of the series. Another issue arises from the political orientation of the Eiffelverein at the time of the volume's publication. The organization was quick to affiliate itself with the new regime, broadcasting its allegiance and shared outlook at the organization's general meeting in June 1933. Eiffel Verein preservation campaigns now incorporated Nazi officials and rhetoric. For example, at a rally held in August 1933 against the disfigurement of a local volcanic lake by private development, a Nazi functionary delivered one of the event's main speeches. 
In his remarks, Joseph Boosley assured the crowd that his superior, the regional gover governor, Heinz Hacke, stood, quote, shoulder to shoulder with the Eiffelverein to protect this incredible place, end quote. He ended his remarks by exclaiming that the preservationist efforts were an expression of Adolf Hitler's will and cited a relevant passage from Hitler's recent Postdam Day speech in which he said, quote, we want to cultivate in humble awe the great tradition of our people, their history and their culture as inexhaustible resources of real inner strength and the possibility of renewal in dark times, end quote. In the end, Saunders' close engagement with the Eiffelverein may have been motivated primarily by financial interests, among them the hope of securing future contracts with the organization. In fall 1934, Sander was especially successful in this regard. He had contributed to the organization's um, publications since the early 1930s, likely on the recommendation of his friend, the regionalist writer Ludwig Matar, who was very involved with the organization. But in September, his work appeared for the first time on the cover of the Eiffel Verein's monthly periodical. Within the issue itself, editors included Die Eiffel in the periodical's recurring section on Heimat literature. The editor's pithy description offers no indication that the volume was at odds with the organization's current configuration, calling it simply, quote, a neat little volume that captures the char characteristic features of the Eiffel landscape and its man-made cultural monuments, and invites you to visit the green border region in an inconspicuous manner, end quote. Saunders' work appeared again on the cover of the periodical's November 1934 issue. In a gesture of self-referential humor, the photograph shows an elderly couple poring over the September issue over their, in, during their Vesper hour. The, the photograph appeared to be a reworked version of one Saunders stage with an, earlier, uh, with an issue of the radio periodical, Verag, that featured the same photograph of a moated castle on its cover. The prominence of the radio in the frame and existence of additional photographs from the session that included the Verag issue suggest that this version came first. It appears never to have been published during Saunders' lifetime, but it was included in the first reconstruction of People of the 20th Century published in the early 1980s. And this um, image on the screen is taken from that. The stage photographed offers an intriguing moment of intersection between the Eiffel Verein, so prominent in Die Eiffel, and the periodical Verag, which enters the story of the cultural landscape volumes uh, in a significant way in later, in later volumes, or the series in later volumes. While Saunders' approach to cultural landscape in Die Eiffel was rooted in the Weimar period, the political context in which it appeared and the volume's engagement with the Eiffel Verein molded its final meaning and potential as propaganda. Saunders' openness to incorporating ideas from regime-aligned organizations and publications would lead subsequent volumes to be more ideologically oriented. Indeed, in the series' final volumes, Saunders' approach to cultural landscape shifted further in the direction of the regime as he came into greater di dialogue with the visual and literary culture of the Third Reich, including the radio periodical Verag and the regionalist writer Ludwig Matar. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Anna. And I'd like to now inter introduce our next speaker, uh, Marika Antonucci. Um, and uh, Marika is at Johns Hopkins University, and she will be uh, giving a talk on Marxism and its discontents, and she'll be introduced by her advisor, Molly Warnock. I am delighted to introduce Marika Antonucci. Marika is an exceptional PhD student in history of art at Johns Hopkins University. There she is in the advanced stages of researching and writing a dissertation on conceptions of community and collectivity and Italian art of the 1960s and 70s. Marika holds a BA in history of art and French from New York University and an MA in history of art from the University of Pennsylvania. 
While at Penn, she began laying the groundwork for her current project, writing a carefully researched thesis on the Italian pavilion at the 1976 Venice Biennale. During her time at Johns Hopkins, Marika has received various internal awards, including a Dean's Teaching Fellowship for the coming fall. She has also won a number of highly competitive external honors, including her current pre-doctoral fellowship at the Center for Italian Modern Art in New York City. She comes to this position following several years at the Bibliotheca Herziana Max Planck Institute für Kunstgeschichte in Rome, where she participated centrally in the new research initiative, Rome Contemporary. Marika's dissertation considers the vicissitudes of art in Italy during the so-called years of lead, as artists and workers question the existing social order and at times joined forces in demanding sweeping structural transformations. Uneasily bound in a wider reevaluation of central tenets of Marxist thought, as manifest in the emergence of autonomous currents, this unrest also saw artists rethinking the legacies of the avant-garde, trying out new and often volatile conceptions of individuality and collectivity, and interrogating variously formulated connections between formal and material innovation and social progress. Drawing upon sustained archival research and extensive visual analysis, Marika addresses a combination of canonical and historically under-recognized figures, enabling us to grasp the manifold ways in which different objects and practices take over and transform new conceptions of community. She speaks to us today about a pivotal moment in the art and reception of the Italian painter Renato Guttoso. Please join me in welcoming Marika Antonucci. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share my research with you today. So I'll begin. Describing the Guttuso's first Italian retrospective held in Parma in late 1963, critic Arturo Carlo Quintavalle described it as, quote, the most heated and perhaps even the most productive controversy of Italian culture after the extremely violent ones on realism in the years between 1950 and 1955, end quote. Utuzo, the preeminent painter of the Italian Communist Party, or PCE, had been a central figure in those post-war controversies, which had been ignited by his party's increasingly divisive rebuke of abstraction in support of a readily legible Soviet-style figuration known as realism. As a result, during the 1950s, the party shunned avant-garde techniques such as expressive color, collage, and spatial disruption, considering them elitist and at odds with a materialist conception of history. The Italian art world was soon polarized into bitterly opposing camps, as artists were forced to choose between aesthetic experimentation and political commitment. Despite Cutuzzo's public condemnation of the party's interference beginning in 1948, he swiftly jettisoned the modernist visual strategies that had characterized his output until then. Thus, the tightly compressed pictorial space, redolent of cubist flattening and fragmentation, bold expressive colors, and jagged, heavily abstracted contours that monumentalized the grueling realities of female labor in Cucitrice or seamstress of 1947, quickly gave way to more veristic spatial coordinates and color palettes, as Battaglia del Ponte dell'Amiraglio illustrates. In this modern day history painting, Cutuzzo commemorates a battle central to the Risorgimento, the 19th century Italian struggle for unification. Italian communists mobilized the Risorgimento as a symbolic predecessor for the democratic ambitions of the anti-fascist resistance to which many Italian communists took part. Cutuzzo's work aligned so completely with the party's ideology that its leader, Palmiro Togliatti, commissioned the artist to produce a second version of the work for the party's Institute for Communist Studies in Frattocchi. 
Though perhaps the most well-known moment of Gutuzo's career, this phase only lasted a few years. By the second half of the 1950s, his brushstrokes regained expressivity as he reconsidered his previous rejection of the internationally dominant trend of gestural art making known in Italy as informale and variously embodied by artists like Alberto Burri, Willem de Kooning, and Hans Hartung. His numerous texts and interview of the period reveal his candid reflection on realism's shortcomings and his desire to create an art that spoke to the new experiences of advanced capitalist society. Gutuzo embraced new subject matter, such as city dwellers, exploiting expressive gesture, and Fauvist-inspired color to convey capitalist estrangement. His party, too, was dealt a major blow as it fumbled its responses to the revelations of Joseph Stalin's repressive regime and the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956, events which set Western Marxism into a general crisis. Furthermore, the rise of more militant critiques challenged the party's complacency with capitalism and its reform-oriented approach. As preparations for Gutuzo's retrospective began against this complex geopolitical and cultural backdrop, the artist was once again at the center of a debate between art making and political ideology. At issue there was the artist's Marxism, understood as problematic both by the exhibition's organizers and an increasingly divided leftist art press. Examining the Parma exhibition, I argue, yields two important insights. The binary narrative itself manifests the thorny relations between geopolitics and aesthetic canonization, while the reactions it generated signal that the question of a Marxist art in Italy was by no means settled or unquestionably accepted during the 1960s, a state of affairs consonant with the increasingly irreconcilable fractures plaguing the Italian leftist cultural sphere during the 1960s. Surprisingly, Roberto Longhi, the formalist critic and art historian best known for his studies of the Italian Quattrocento and of Caravaggio, spearheaded the organizational committee of Guttuso's retrospective. The exhibition displayed much of Guttuso's polemical realist work, such as the 1949 Occupation of the Uncultivated Lands, which depicted the plight of landless peasants in southern Italy an issue dear to the Italian communists. However, this aspect of Gutuzo's oeuvre was minimized within the catalog. Alongside two previously published texts by Longhi, additional essays by his associates Giovanni Testori and Franco Russoli presented similar readings of Gutuzo that resonated with Longhi's earlier commentary, particularly in their discomfort with realism an insistence on Gutuzo's dialogue with paradigmatic Western art movements, and a clear preference for Gutuzo's recent work. It was this last aspect of Gutuzo's practice, begun in the second half of the 1950s, that these men most admired precisely because of its perceived resonance with Informale. Heralded as, quote, a marvelous recovery, end quote, the emergence of expressive brushwork and a flirtation with abstraction, both absent during the artist's realist phase, were seen to compellingly address newly urgent post-war existential anxieties. Underscoring the curatorial support for this latest stylistic shift, an image of the artist himself seated in front of an unfinished, largely abstract portion of canvas appeared beside the catalog's title page. Likely an early stage of one of his nudes of the period, such as Grande Nudo Trasversale, the cropped canvas recalled the paint handling of prominent artists like Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning. Together, the exhibition's depolitization of Gutuzo's practice and its emphasis on his most recent, more gestural work spoke to broader Cold War era anxieties about the artist's legacy as a Marxist artist. 
in a socio-historical climate newly destabilized by the events of 1956, in which details of Joseph Stalin's repressive regime came to light and the Soviet army invaded Hungary, Kutuzov's communist leanings likely appeared troublesome for critics like Longhi. Downplaying Gutuzo's politics and aligning him with discourses of international gestural painting that were implicitly coded as liberal, neutralized this threat by allowing an alternative, more palatable account of Gutuzo to emerge. Thus, by 1963, Gutuzo's canonization into the Italian artistic tradition had come at the expense of his ideological commitment, a stance that immediately incensed the PGE press. While some voices close to the party only moderately criticized the depoliticized, the depoliticized presentation of Gutuzo's oeuvre, critic Antonello Trombadori penned a much more confrontational response for the party's weekly Vie Nuove. From the argumentative title, Polemical Guide to the Exhibition of Gutuzo in Parma, the impassioned humanism of Renato Gutuzo, both the party's scorn for the exhibition's historical revisionism and its own official view on Gutuzo were both startlingly evident. Objecting to the exhibition's devaluation of Gutuzo's realist phase, and more broadly of its refusal to accept Gutuzo's political commitment as an interpretive key to his multi-decade practice, Trombadori instead presented his fellow PGE comrade as an indispensable agent in the orthodox Marxist revolutionary cause. Underpinning the persuasive nature of Gutuzo's oeuvre for Trombadori was the artist's firm belief in human progress, his humanism as he defined it. This faith in subjective agency to direct the course of history towards a socialist future an idea central to PGE Orthodox Marxism, defined the artist's significance and, importantly, set him apart from his contemporaries. Trombadori saw this faith in human progress at work in both Cutuzo's realist works and, importantly, in his more recent output. To state his point clearer, Trombadori looked to Francis Bacon for an illustrative foil. Without denying Bacon's importance, the PTE critic viewed Bacon as trapped in isolated existential anguish. Gutuzo, on the other hand, mobilized a similar artistic gesture towards what he saw as progressive political ends. Though sensitive to current problems of society, he argued, Gutuzo's work manifested the potential of a new socialist society founded on, quote, a reconstitution on new foundations of the unity of man, end quote, a, a view dear to the orthodox majority of the PGE. Yet it was precisely this optimism and the unquestioned efficacy of its attendant pictorial lexicon that alarmed younger Marxist commentators. Part of a new generation of thinkers sensitive to the profound and wide ranging effects of advanced capitalism informed by the philosophical currents of operaismo or workerism and later autonomous Marxism, these figures no longer saw revolution as a self-evident certainty. In their view, the confident attitude of their elder comrades seemed at best naive and at worst evidence of capitalist collusion. In the face of capitalism's unceasing encroachment into everyday life, if art had any chance of fostering critical consciousness, these critics believed, it had to do so through radical experimentation. For Alberto Boato, the first dissenting voice, Gutuzo's practice fell short of such ambitions. Taking aim at Gutuzo's most recent works, which combine painting and collage, Boato questioned the progressive thrust of Gutuzo's visual vocabularies. Focusing on Mattino nello studio, morning in the studio, the young critic noted that the painted elements, the straw chairs, the painter's tools, and architecture depicted a, quote, rustic, artisanal, and pre-industrial reality, end quote. While the collage portions, such as the article fragments in the newspaper being read by the man in the foreground, 
and the scraps of letters and papers on the table in front of him spoke to the current industrial reality. The problem, Boato lamented, was the way in which these two different artistic media interacted in Gutuzo's composition. Because Gutuzo manipulated the collaged elements to suit the needs of his painted composition, for example, the way in which the pasted newspaper elements correspond to the spatial coordinates dictated by the artist's painted outline, the painting preserved rather than undermined pictorial logic, despite its mixed media nature. In so doing, Boato lamented, Morning in the studio nostalgically and problematically imagined a world that was felt to be increasingly incompatible with the new realities of advanced capitalism. Critics associated with more radical publications close to militant activism like Quaderni Piacentini offered a similar assessment. Although its editorial board lamented the insufficiently critical party endorsement of Gutuzo's work, they were hardly surprised. It would have been naive to expect something different from the usual celebratory chorus of our official criticism, they wrote, justifying the review by the painter Claudio Olivieri, which followed. Olivieri also challenged the relevancy of Gutuzo's stylistic choices, particularly his appeals to Cubism and Expressionism, which he understood to function as stylistic conventions rather than experimental and thus potentially critical sparks. In his words, instead of being surprises in the act of modifying the real, Kutuzo's gestures simply add themselves and overlap. The charges leveled by Boato and Olivieri regarding the static nature of Kutuzo's art paralleled the broader challenge to official communist orthodoxy being mounted at that time by younger, more militant activists and thinkers. In so doing, thorny ideological battles were once again transposed into the artistic arena. At that time, dissident communists associated with the intellectual currents later codified under the banner of autonomous Marxism began chastising the party for what they perceived to be a reformist and inadequate agenda focused on wage bargaining. In their view, Progressive gains for workers failed to question the inherently exploitative nature of capitalist accumulation more generally. Rejecting cooperation with government institutions advocated a forceful break from capitalist production and its attendant social inequalities through wildcat strikes and other disruptive tactics. Capitalism, in their view, could not be salvaged in any way. Only a radical reorganization of social life was possible. The charges leveled at Gutuzo by more radically oriented critics like Boato and Olivieri transpose the intellectual assumptions and tactics of autonomous Marxist thought into the sphere of artistic language. Much like the Communist Party itself, Gutuzo was understood by these figures to be too reformist, and his artistic approach was similarly felt to be incapable of responding to the current reality because it did not sufficiently interrogate the visible world. World. The effects of his stylistic choices like collage and expressive color paralleled those of wage bargaining. Both were seen as stale and powerless to change fundamental horizons, whether visual or social. The party's response to these criticisms of Gutuzo further aligns with the way in which the PGE itself reacted to such growing internal resentment and critique by more militant Marxists. Writing for the PGE newspaper Rinascita in April 1964, Alessandro del Guercio, a young critic of roughly the same age as Boato, tackled the charges his comrade had leveled regarding Gutuzo's spatial logic. Other works in Gutuzo's oeuvre, he argued, disrupted spatial relations to a larger degree than the examples Boato highlighted adding that plenty of well-respected artists like Giacometti employed somewhat traditional spatial relations without compromising their reputation as advanced artists. More broadly, Del Guercio disputed Boato's pessimistic understanding of contemporary reality as, quote, conditioned by the power of machines and of industry, 
end quote. In the end, Del Guercio dismissed Boato's reading without taking its essential claims into consideration, a stance that many figures associated with the PGE adopted in light of the mounting challenges to Guttuso's work. A similar attitude characterized the positions of other figures close to the party during a roundtable discussion hosted by another party publication, Il Contemporaneo. It is not possible to discuss that event at length here, but the conversation generally shared Del Guercio's defensive focus on refuting minor points aimed at discrediting the challenge to Guttuso's socially engaged aesthetics. Thus, despite the critiques advanced by the younger leftist critics, the party itself proved to be unwilling to consider whether Guttuso's current output successfully manifested a sufficiently developed Marxist critical awareness and, relatedly, whether it most effectively represented current histor socio-historical contingencies. Such a dismissal resonated with the ways in which the PGE generally refuted the ideological challenges mounted by more radically oriented thinkers whom it pushed out without much room for debate. As a result, the leftist fear fractured as various radical revolutionary groups, such as Potero Perayo and Lotta Continua, grew in popularity. Tensions would eventually come to a head at the end of the decade during the so-called hot autumn of 1969, when a wave of wildcat strikes supported by these militant groups threatened to destabilize Italy Italy's industrial production, and its society more generally. Examining Guttuso's first retrospective reveals the ways in which geopolitical and ideological entanglements, both domestic and foreign, underpinned the construction of his legacy. The crumbling critical consensus surrounding Guttuso within the leftist cultural sphere mirrors the broader irreconcilable ideological fissures that developed within the Italian left during the 1960s. Moreover, the politics of the exhibition itself speak to art's entanglement with Cold War era anxieties. From both inside and outside his party, Guttuso's status as a Marxist artist, along with his reputation, were far from settled. Returning to the specific debates reveals a radically contested environment that complicates any def easy definition of a Marxist art within post-war Italy. Freshly elucidated, the terms of these debates reshape our understanding of the slippery relations between ideolo ideology, artistic form, and canonization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marika. Um, now I want to introduce our final speaker, Zoe Kopman from the University of Maryland. Uh, she will be uh, speaking uh, on dismantling the Christ face, the human and the inhuman in Henry Tonk's uh, Faces of War. And she will be introduced by her advisor, Anthony Colantuono. Greetings, I'm Anthony Colantuono, Professor and Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of Art History and Archaeology, University of Maryland College Park. Before all else, I would like to thank the organizers of the symposium for all that they have done to create this experience for our speakers amidst the trying circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic. This opportunity to introduce my graduate advisee, Zoe Copeman, reminds me how privileged we are as professors as we get to know and work with the best and brightest young scholars in their formative years. I first encountered Zoe when she was an undergraduate at the University of Maryland College Park, receiving her bachelor's as a double degree major in art history and psychology, summa cum laude, in 2015. In addition to teaching Zoe at College Park, I was also fortunate to have her in my education abroad course on Baroque Rome, where she stood out both as a top performer under the very challenging conditions of study in a foreign country and as a remarkably steady and mature presence, an example of discipline and virtue for her fellow students. As an undergraduate, Zoe had in fact emerged not only as a genuine leader among her peers in the undergraduate art history community, but also as one of the most unique and original thinkers ever to come through the program, earning numerous awards and honors upon her graduation. 
And I'll make special mention here of the Dean Senior Scholar Award, among the other highly competitive honors. After completing her undergraduate studies, Zoe went on to do an MA in the History of Art at University College London, earning her degree with distinction in November 2019. She then returned to the US and entered the PhD program at the University of Maryland in fall 2020, with both a graduate assistantship and the highly competitive university-wide flagship fellowship awarded by the university's graduate school. What has struck me about Zoe's current approach to the history of art is the way that both her selection of research topics and the terms of her inquiry are guided by a unique sense of humanity and a deep empathy for the predicaments of both artist and subject, particularly in the field of portraiture. I think this will be apparent in her lecture titled Dismantling the Christ Face, the Human and the Inhuman in Henry Tonk's Faces of War. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Colin Tornow, and thank you to Dr. Katz for your introductions and all those at the Barnes for their amazing help to make this conference happen. My title, Dismantling the Christ Face, comes from a very specific theory put forth by Deleuze and Guattari in A Thousand Plateaus, in which they propose that the Christ Face, or the Euro-American image of Christ, is a machine that overdetermines subjects' identities. So when we in Western societies are faced with another, we determine who that person is based on how much they deviate from our image of Christ as a white cis male. And Deleuze and Guattari propose art as a means of dismantling this machine or Christ face, offering even Francis Bacon as just one example. This presentation asks an alternative question though. What of the face not dismantled by art, but by war? Working with the plastic surgeon Harold Gillies from 1916 to 1918, the artist Henry Tonks composed 75 pastels of facially wounded World War I soldiers. Along with detailed diagrams, plaster casts, and photographs, Gillies commissioned these pre and post surgical pastels for facial reconstructive purposes. As such, they are medical illustrations of individuals with distinct though disfigured physiognomies. Since the online publishing of the Tonks pastels in June 2007, the works have been exhibited at numerous locations, the Wellcome Collection, University College London, and the Hunterian Museum, just to name a few. Rested from their original context and left to the devices of the art world, the illustrations have been reconfigured from instructive tools to artistic portraits. Yet in the wake of this newfound attention, the literature predominantly focuses on the subjectivity then inherent in such works, that of the artist, his sitters, and their new voyeurs. Their genre has also been questioned by scholars like Emma Chambers, but their definitive classification is still unresolved. Existing in a liminal sphere between art and science, the pastels challenge our preconceived art historical categories. As portraits, they invoke a sense of lost identity. As medical illustrations, they serve as aids in the reconstruction of that very loss. No matter which category though, the pastels serve as mediators, transitions between an inhuman and a human face. The works are often classified as medical portraits, but what exactly is a medical portrait? The medical portrait is to the individual disease as the portrait is to the individual body. But as medical illustrations are essentially visual images marking deviations from a standard physiology, the implication of a medical portrait is that the human body that we are viewing is a deviation from standard physiognomy and even humanity. That is, it's the very deviation from the Christ face. Using the Tonks pastels as a case study, I aim to divulge how pathologies are transferred onto their human canvases, and how this very transfer is used in medical visual resources to justify and preserve whiteness as standard physiology. Before their lives as artworks and galleries, 
the Tonks pastels remained relatively removed from prying eyes. Tonks did display these slightly less than life-size illustrations on his office wall here at Sidcup, but their viewing from the outside world undeniably disturbed the artist. In the midst of creating his pastels in 1917, Tonks received a letter from the Ministry of Information asking to use his work as propaganda. Tonks was less than enthusiastic on the subject, stating, They are, I think, rather dreadful subjects for the public view. Importantly, even though they are referred to as a whole as Faces of War, this title is a contemporary edition. Each pastel was its own entry with an individual function. Tonks himself classified them as technical illustrations, and they later took on an archival function in Harold Gillies's Plastic Surgery of the Face. Published in 1920, Gillies' book is a compendium of the plastic surgeon's work at Sidcup, in which Gillies explains his procedures and their implications for the medical field. Drawing on medical atlases of old, Gillies employed the pastels to illustrate details the camera failed to pick up on like in case eight, where the illustration highlights a mucous membrane. He also used the pastels as replacements when the negatives were missing from a patient's profile, like in case 244. On the page, these pastels are treated like any other clinical representation. Tonks' name is absent with only Gilly's curt captions of healed condition and after operation. The only indication that these were not standard practices comes in the way Gillies adamantly explains the role of Tonks and other artists in his process. Along with the pastels, Gillies commissioned wax models to help in his own understanding of the modeling of living facial tissue. The tactile quality of both wax and pastel emphasizes Gillies' own understanding of the malleability of the face. However, what also becomes clear throughout the text is Gilly's lack of interest in his patients as individuals. In line with the history of medical illustrations, Gilly's commissioned representations were not of men, but of their deformities. Such is evident in the case of Private Edward Palmer. Initially admitted to Cambridge Military Hospital at Aldershot on October 19, 1916, Private Palmer underwent several operations with Gillies to reconstruct his nose, lips, and portions of his upper jaw. The cause of Palmer's wound is unclear from his case description, focusing instead on the complications of his surgery and the reason for their unsatisfactory result. Gillies may have reconstructed the faces of Palmer and his fellow soldiers, but it is the rheumatologist Andrew Bomji's recent work that has restored the identities of these men. From Bomji's research, one learns that after his discharge from Aldershot, Private Palmer served during World War II, and he would live through both world wars to the age of 86. Bomji also provides the small yet intimate detail that Palmer had enlisted under age by using the name and the date of birth of his older sibling who had died in infancy. Private Palmer was originally not Edward Palmer, but Herbert Palmer. When exhibited at the Hunterian Museum in 2014, Palmer's pastel displayed him with the name he had used to enlist, Edward. In the context of the exhibition, the man needed a name, any name. Nevertheless, it is only through Bomji's research that museum goers could even be made aware of either of his identities. For Gillies, he was case 111. In following the medical paradigm since the late 18th century, Gillies largely dismisses his patients' identities. Case numbers replace names, biographical details are interspersed occasionally, but only if they relate to a particularity of a wound, not a patient. As Suzanne Bernoff notes, Gilly's language is often emotionless when it comes to these disfigured faces of war. And Bernoff equates this to the ways in which British society approached the disfigured face in general. Unlike their amputee counterparts seen here, who were often used in propaganda campaigns, these faces of war were relatively absent from public view. However, just because the civil sphere 
did not actively see the disfigured face of war, did not mean they were not aware of it. During this time, the town of Sidcup painted some of their park benches blue, designating them for those with facial deformities. Not for the sake of the soldiers, but for those who might find them too distressing to behold. Across the UK, a Beauty and the Beast trope emerged. Stories of beautiful nursemaids reviving the spirits of deformed men, wives standing by their now hideous husbands, and uninhibited children fleeing before their grotesque fathers. They all took over the collective imagination. The media's image of the soldier may have remained a youthful, Christ-like man, sacrificing self for nation. But the image of those whose sacrifice entailed losing their representation of self par excellence, they were forced to the margins of British society and then even linked to a pathological other. In the years leading up to World War I, plastic surgery increasingly turned from mere functional repair to cosmetic adjustment. Playing to a pervasive discourse surrounding morality and aesthetics, plastic surgeons now saw it as their moral imperative to correct ugliness. Gillies was no exception. Towards the end of plastic surgery, he betrays the book's overall objectivity when he launches into a discussion of how his surgical work on war-torn soldiers will help repair deformities in the civil sphere. As he states, Turning to syphilis as the principal peacetime destroyer of the nose, the author has not yet seen a case which is not amenable to the methods evolved by him during the war. The old physiognomy of syphilis was near one and the same as the new physiognomy of war. And in the chapter in which Private Palmer's case falls, Injuries of the Nose, this relationship is divulged much less objectively. The distinct syphilitic pug nose, as Gillies goes on to describe it, could also be summed up by the French in their saying, Before he was horrible, now he is ridiculous. During World War I, syphilis was still an incurable disease associated with moral degeneration, especially that of the prostitute. Within the collective imagination, a damaged face was not only a grotesque face to flee from, but it was also the face of aberrant sexuality. Unlike Private Palmer's wound and its close affiliations with syphilis, Private Smith's injury is minimal in comparison. Yet Tonks's approaches for the pre- and post-illustrations of such a small surgery only serve to amplify their transitory state. In Private Smith's before image, the light falls on the side of his chin, highlighting the area of subject, the damaged jaw. Shot during a campaign in Mesopotamia, Private Smith was sent to Aldershot, where his lip was reunited and he was given a dental prosthesis. Surgery still afresh, his after image is strikingly similar to his before. Still, there is a critical difference. The light no longer falls purely on the wound but equally over the entire face. The artist's touch emphasizes the shift in attention, too. Whereas the first drawing is composed of smudged gradations of reds and browns, with only clear delineation around the wound itself, the second outlines the whole face in black. Effectively, the post-surgical image takes that which was little defined in its pre-surgical incarnation and solidifies it making the entire face a stable and permanent whole. This fixidity imparted within such an ephemeral medium is amplified when we examine yet another portrait of a soldier with a wounded jaw. Along with the rest of the pastels, Tonks drew case 906 in 1917. His file details that the subject had returned to Nigeria fitted with a temporary prosthesis. Though the man had already undergone several surgeries, having lost the totality of his lower jaw, Gilly scheduled several more upon the patient's return. However, there is no record that the man ever did. The archive is only left with his pre-surgical portrait and photographs, and case 906 is also missing from Gilly's compendium, Plastic Surgery of the Face. 
Moreover, the Archive has not yet updated Bamji's rediscovery of this man's identity. Known only as Head of a Negro in UCL Art Collections, Case 906 is actually Private Williams. In contrast to Private Deeks, whose damaged jaw is clearly delineated and defined, Private Williams's wound completely blends into his neck and skin. The lips and sides of his face, outlined in that same hard black charcoal, hardly give detail to the man's deformity. Even the red of his mouth is perplexingly vacant of substance. Where the tongue should meet the deformed chin, there is simply a smudge of brown that extends down the patient's neck. The same attention that is given to the patient's side, where the deformity seems to begin, is lacking when it comes to its most important feature, the missing lower jaw. Here, the photographs of the case do more to describe the detail of the sitter's features. The pastel, for all its transience, imparts that the deformity and the patient's skin are one. This revelation is not to say that Tonks's Tonks intended the sparseness simply because Private Williams was black. However, it is reasonable to propose that Tonks, as a draftsman that mainly studied white bodies, did not have the same approach when it came to sitting and confronting a black patient. This is not just a failing of Tonks's education, but the entire medical field. The troubling erasure of black and brown bodies from medical visual resources is all the more disturbing with the knowledge that generally, generally those bodies dissected in the name of Western medicine were not white. A lithograph of a black man's dissected torso, shown here, serves as a rare example of this reality. Standard medical illustrations of tranquil white subjects truncated to display inner physiology are neither human nor inhuman but a liminal being existing between the two, what Richard Barnett proposes as the abhuman. And this is a preferable term, as the abhuman here implies that the subject is not entirely inhuman, but in transition to becoming such. This abhuman quality is even emphasized by the medium of pastels, which preserves this transitory state through its own impermanence. As abhuman or transitory, there is an implication that these men may transform back into their former identities through the use of surgical operation, that is, for the white soldier. The same cannot be definitively said for Private Williams. Again, unlike with Private Deeks, where the eye constantly transfers between the exterior face and the interior body, with Private Williams, the viewer is left only with the soldier's mangled exterior. Here, the face is no longer in transition. It is no longer abhuman, but has fully crossed into the domain of the inhuman, fixed into a state of pathology for its extreme deviation from the prescribed standard of all medical portraits, the Christ face. When met with medical portraits, the likes of Henry Tonks's pastels of wounded soldiers, the impulse is to repair the surface, re-territorialize that which has been de-territorialized from a body back into a face. To put plainly, we attempt to transform the figures before us from objects or medical illustrations to subjects or portraits. The mangled face of war, though, deemed initially grotesque and inappropriate for public view, was seen as nevertheless a rectifiable trait, or rather a trait that could be surgically repaired through medicine. Whilst the white pastels become portraits of men with clearly defined individual characteristics and identities, Private Williams remains an illustration where the body and the surface still mingle as one. And as with other medical illustrations depicting deformity on a human surface, the body is also rendered as if the pathology and the person are one. Acting as a counter to the rest of the series, Private Williams draws attention to the value we place on the surface in the construction of identity. 
If we were to reverse this relationship and show the interior and the exterior as one on the white body and face, the absurdity of conveying one's skin as wound is exposed. The face and the body are, of course, not one. If anything, Tonks pastels prove that what is inhuman is not the grotesque face, nor certainly the black soldier, but the trauma imposed upon all these men. These disfigured faces of war render visible that which lies beyond the surface of the face. Its secret. The secret is that there is no secret. The grotesque or the other may manifest on the exterior of the body, but it is only skin deep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, and now we're going to um, sort of uh, engage in a series of uh, conversations, questions about the papers. Um, and and what what I'm going to hope to do is sort of kick things off with some questions for each of you, and then we're going to open it up to uh, general audience uh, questioning. So I want to begin with a question for for Marika, um, specifically concerning the um, idea of the uh, easel scaled painting and its uh, one would presume rather ironic. Um, relationship as a medium of Marxist ideology, given its long history as a commodity form, and how that was negotiated. That's a that's a great question, and um, it's it's sort of a, a strange uh, dualism in Gutuzo's work because he is at once in the fifties, at least, producing these kind of large tableaus that have these scenes that are uh, close to, you know, what the party is, is very interested in. And at the same time, he's also, you know, on the market selling these large and, and small sort of easel type paintings that are clearly, like you said, functioning as, as commodities. And uh, it's quite interesting in the 60s, he's also uh, profiled in sort of mass media publications as and described as sort of a uh, one of the funny uh, headlines that I read one one time in an archive was was Gutuzo, um, and uh, a communist artist that is that is liked by the bourgeoisie, which kind of tells you sort of this interesting dynamic and in, in the fact that he's both producing for the party these sort of ideologically loaded paintings and also producing small. Um, portraits and, and things that don't have that much overtly to do with uh, the, the sort of ideological tenor of his work. And the exhibition itself had that fully on display. That was a, a contradiction that uh, some younger commentators obviously, uh, you know, seized upon. Um, but the sort of people closer to the party chose to sort of gloss over uh, this sort of very evident contradiction, uh, and thank you for pointing that out. It's uh, they're sort of kind of both there at the same time, and uh, a lot yeah. to, to and, think about. And and what, would it have been the case that all of the realist works were of sort of bigger than easel painting scale? That were they were, they were more mural scale and thus more public, or did he make some of the realist images smaller? He did. He they. Most of them were quite large, um, but he also made a series of drawings that were very close to, had a lot of anti-fascist symbolism that were then sort of published as artist books and the party sort of republished them uh, to be bought uh, by, you know, people who, who wanted to and also subscribers to party publications. So he also did do sort of smaller format, more ideologically loaded works, um, mainly I'd say for for large scale distribution was was drawings and prints, and then a, a few paintings as well. But the, the 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 realist paintings are sort of these large tableau like paintings, like you said, very large scale history type paintings. Thank you. So um, I wanted to ask Hannah about um, 
the contiguity between um, the very specific project you described and the mm -hmm. larger Nazi investment in taxonomy and classification. Um, and to ask whether you understand this project in sum as a Nazification, if you will, uh, inherently, that seemed to be sort of wanting to come out but never quite explicitly mm -hmm. expressed in the paper, a Nazification of the German landscape itself. Hmm. Yeah, no, um, it's a very good question. Uh, I think that, I mean, this is, I had tried to convey in this, it's a complex book and there's really, it's really sort of a bridge book between the, his Weimar era practice and this new, or sort of this emergent cultural visual landscape, which was still like very much in flux, which I didn't really get into in the especially in the early 1930s when they come, or after 1933 when they come to power. Um, I think it's a really, I think it's a hard question. I don't think that this is necessarily, I don't think this volume is not to find the German landscape, but I think that it's hard to produce a cultural landscape during this period that doesn't have certain undertones to it, especially in the way that this is sort of presenting this idyllic view of Germany, which was such an important aspect of propaganda to sort of see um, Germany as like harmonious and happy and complete. But, you know, there is a big difference between how he treats his subjects and focusing on class instead of Germans as one unified Volksgemeinschaft, which is the negation of class and profession instead of seeing Germany as one sort of group. So I think that that difference in class is very important in distinguishing it from projects that were really focused um, on sort of creating this not so fine landscape. But something that I'm interested in, and this is just about the first volume, is how Sander kind of changes over the course of this the books, especially when he comes into greater dialogue with figures like Ludwig Matar, who I mentioned, and how he comes to see the landscape in a more um, sort of essentialized um, way and the farmer as a more essentialized figure. So I think certainly when you look over the course of the series, you can see that the first one is very much like dealing with Weimar era ideas of the landscape. Um, but still, especially with the Eiffelverein, um, complicated in terms of its relationship to propaganda and the regime. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, so, Zoe, I wanted to ask you about um, about contemporaneous developments in the avant-garde at the time of Tonks's painting, and um, because Tonks was himself a, uh, a professor of art, um, to what extent do you think uh there is either an implicit commentary um on the facial deformities of the avant-garde which i'm presuming by the time he did these works he would have been able to find in the uk um and um and if not that then is there any kind of self-consciousness on his part at the sort of formal symmetry going on between these two very very different morally and uh and of course uh formally uh distinct works thank you dr katz yeah that's a great question i can't really answer the abstract part i have read some of his correspondences with others while he was working on these pastels and he was interested in not just conveying realistically or naturally rather these individuals as he was facing them and encountering them in a in that very intimate situation of making a portrait of someone uh, he also talks about the aesthetics of them and kind of the beauty of sculpting the face and he compares a lot of these sitters actually with Greek sculptures and talks about some of those with like Edward Palmer, who has are missing noses, he compares that to fragmented bodies and are 
seeing of Roman busts without noses and how we are, when we're confronted with those images, it's, we don't have the same response. And that equation of the disfigured face with um, the sculpted face is just very interesting. The way that Tonks is very, is extremely empathetic towards these men's situations. Thank you. Um, so we're open now to uh, questions from the audience. I don't see any yet, so I will take advantage of, and ask another question, but uh, should they come in, please uh, please do so soon. Um, so uh, Marika, I also wanted to ask you about the relationship in Italy to popular front politics, such a big thing in the United States. It was a cause for huge debates within the left-wing world, and especially the popular front idea that a self-critical art was in fact the way to prevent the excesses of Stalinism and, um, and safeguard the purity of a true revolution. It's a, it's quite a complex uh, debate that's, that's had in the Italian Communist Party at the time because uh, Togliatti is in fact quite close to Stalin and Stalin asks him uh, to be the head of the common form and he declines, um, but he is, you know, in close contact with Stalin for, you know, the entirety of his life basically. And he's also in exile in Russia during the war. So he, he has to sort of walk a, a very uh, fine line between, uh, you know, uh, being close to a very Soviet line and being kind of openly close to what the what the Soviets are saying, and also uh, realizing that in Italy, um, any type of socialist agenda has to be very, very reformist and parliamentarian and. Uh, transitional in a very democratic way, um, and he he calls it the the third way, the terza via al socialismo. So um, it's it's a quite contradictory situation that he finds himself in. And even after 1956, publicly he's always on the side of Stalin, and he says, you know, you stay by your side even when that side makes a mistake. And he sort of does not really give in to uh, any type of on, on the culture side any type of revisionism of any type of concepts that are not socialist realism in, in literature and in art, even when it's very clear that the artists themselves are not very interested in, in doing any of that. And uh, the public is also not reacting so well and they sort of perceive it as kind of a, a, a very strong um, you know, pressure on artistic creativity. So it's a debate that is, not very much present in in the central committee within the party and it it is very obviously present outside in artists who choose to either leave the party and uh you know join more militant uh positions or artists who are just isolated at the time during the 1950s who really feel like they want to you know remain ideologically connected to the party but feel completely isolated from what uh, the party is saying. And it's not really until the end of the 1950s, uh, which is also when we see Gutuzo kind of backtrack and say, okay, you know, this didn't, this wasn't really working and we need to kind of think about a new type of cultural expression. But, but again, even, even Gutuzo never really goes as far to, as to say, you know, let's, let's rethink everything and, and do something totally experimental. It's, it's always, yeah, exactly. Right. Thank you. Oh. Um, and uh, and Hannah, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, if you feel that there was a, a misreading of um, Zander's earlier work by Nazi officials in the act of the initial commission, which is to say that they took his famous uh, taxonomic project and understood it in line with their own ideology as opposed to his understanding of class and social differential. Yeah, well, I think that this, Ryan, I mean, it was, 
Well, I, oh, this, so like, I think, are you referring to the section where um, they approve that the Nazi, that the um, right, the literature chamber, sorry, approves the commission for the works? Is that what you're well, referring to? I, I'm asking specifically whether in approving the works, they were mm -hmm. looking at his earlier work and saw him as a kind of proto-Nazi in mm -hmm. his excavation of the Deutsche Volk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. No. Very interesting question. Yeah. I think that, I think that that question really brings up an important point about sort of the reception of Sonder and how we've come to understand Face of Our Time, the famous book, as this very um, anti-Nazi book because it shows these parts of German society that were um, were not approved of by the new regime, but really the idea that that book was so at odds. Um, with the regime isn't very accurate, even though it was um, censored in 1936, which I think was probably because of um, the introduction that was written by a Jewish author, Alfred Dublin. So I think that there wasn't the understanding of Sonder and his work as at odds with someone who could continue to create a project um, that was in line with the regime. And so I think that I don't know, I don't necessarily believe that there was a misreading of Face of Our Time as explicitly in line with sort of these racial ideas, but I do think that there was not a sense in which there was, that he couldn't adapt his work and his practice to something that was more appropriate, um, which essentially is what the, um, landscape series is. So I think that there's a clear difference between the racialized um, books and ideas of the Nazi period, but Face of Our Time and Saunders' practice is not um, as at odds or as alar alarming as we maybe think of it now, um, and, and has it's been received since, um, you know, in recent times. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. And we have a we have an audience question, um, and this is Elliot for Zoe. And it, it, hi, Zoe. I'm I'm just a little familiar with photographs of deformity, and I'm thinking about just how much more abrupt or confronting Tonk's pastels were. Could you talk about both the work's relationship to photography and to his use of bright colors? Yeah, that's a great question, and I hope I'm interpreting it correctly. Um, Definitely, when you're faced with the pastels, it's a different experience entirely than with the photographs, not just in terms of tactility, but as you mentioned with color. The pastel in color forces you to confront the interior in ways you do not have in a black and white photograph. So almost obviously we are able to see beyond the skin to the bodily fluids, to um, the muscular beneath in ways that is really, like I said, it confronts you because of that color. It's really potent. And this brings into question ideas of the abject and how we, not just our understanding of the face being disfigured, but also our understanding that what we are looking at is also beneath our skin. And so I definitely agree with you that there's a relationship there that's it's hard for a lot of people to look at, but I think that what it's worth looking at these pastels. And in some ways, I think the pastels almost honor um, these individuals in ways that the photographs do not. Photographs are often very, in, especially medical photographs, are always in this sort of perspective that we need to cure the individual, that we're looking at a specimen. And there's something about the pastels because they're so affiliated with portraiture and they have that color and that vibrancy and that ephemeral quality of pastel that seeing these men in conditions of portraiture, we link them as individuals and not just specimens. Great. Um, all right, let me see if I have, that's really, well, we don't have more questions from the audience. So I think we're gonna call it a day. And, uh, and I'd like now to introduce uh, Martha Lucy with some conclusion. 
<laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it has been a really stimulating day. Thank you so much to all of our students um, for nine excellent papers. Thank you so much to our moderators, Jonathan Katz and Carl Walsh. Thank you to all the advisors um, for you know guiding these students and for your lovely introductions. Um, thank you to our amazing AV team, Gillen, Thomas, Stephen, Frank. Thank you to Aaliyah. And finally, thank you to our co-organizing institutions, Temple, Bryn Mawr, and the University of Pennsylvania. Next year, when we do this, we will hopefully all be in person. Um, but I think we did a good job of adapting this year. So um, everybody have a very good weekend and over and out.